Alrighty. Hey, gang. Welcome back to another episode of Stove Chat. Happy Wednesday. I'm Matt, as always, and we're here for Stove Chat episode 49. And welcome. Hope you guys had a great week. Uh, I've had a great week. It's been pretty darn nice here. A little bit of rain, a little bit of sun, a little bit of surfing, a uh, little bit of firewood action. <laughs> Just kind of settling in. It feels like fall out outside here. I don't know if it is folly where you are, but uh, definitely... Uh, we turned the corner on the holiday weekend there, and and uh, I'm I'm ready for fire season for sure. It's been cold at night, like almost uh, well high 30s, I guess. So so yeah, so it's been it's getting to be that time of year. So nice to see you guys. Thanks for being here, everybody. Nice to see you guys in chat. Mark always learning. Great to see you guys. Um, always learning. Says he's cutting up a hundred foot alder today with a 30 inch base. That's awesome. You know. I think Oregon Coast Green Man and I go back and forth sometimes about the alders, uh, but I, you know, I find that especially those larger ones, they make fantastic firewood. And for the rocket mass heaters, I find that uh, that they're, you know, the alder. I mean, it isn't as energy dense as as fir, but it's still it's adequate firewood for sure it you do go through it pretty fast but it does make good good firewood so here's david swanson good morning david nice to see you so as you guys know we're here at stove chat to talk about building stoves rocket stoves rocket mass heaters masonry stoves masonry heaters cook stoves all kinds of stuff and my website walker stoves has plans for sale and one of the reasons for being here is to be available to answer questions for those of you who are building stoves. So I've been having a great time these last few weeks with all you folks emailing me. Um, really, really appreciate all the support. And uh, it's been really fun to see everyone's builds come together for sure. So um, so thank you for that. And, uh, and this stove chat is a great opportunity to ask questions or get some clarity if you're working on a build, thinking about a build. Um, if you just stumbled across us and, and kind of are just learning about um, cook stoves and rocket stoves and stuff like that, this is a great place to find out, you know, what could work for you in your situation and get some person, personal uh, help. So that's kind of why we're here. And uh, yeah, so with that said, we got a great show for you guys today. Um, I've got some really neat uh, photos I dug up like we talked about last week. I found some old stuff to show you guys that... Uh, that actually I'm really excited to share because I really wanted to um, it, I wanted to revisit some of the ideas there, talk about um, you know what's changed and uh, and where we are now in relation to then, and also to uh, to just sort of highlight some some ideas that I think were good ideas that uh, that we don't want to you know forget about or pass over, and I don't I don't think that's going to happen, but it's good to just reinforce some of that stuff sometimes. So. Um, Augustus, nice to see you. Thanks for being here. And uh, and thanks for the kudos on the episode last week. That's awesome. Yeah, and, and Augustus, we'll do a little more of that today. We'll go a little deeper. Augustus was talking about... Um, you know, going over some of the old techniques and stuff that we've stuff that we've tried to try and... You know, my goal here is always is to try and help people build these things um, as easily as possible to make these more accessible, to get them, you know, in front of more people, to get, you know, less ch smoky chimneys in, in our neighborhoods. And to that end, um, I think one of the important things that we do here, and I recognize that we're just sort of a little backwater of the internet, um, and there's probably not a whole lot of people who are kind of tapping directly into, you know, what we are sort of uh, progressing here, I guess is the right word. Um, but at any rate, I do think it's important to go back and revisit the things that we, you know, the ground that we've been over so it doesn't have to continually be retrodden, um, you know, as, as it were. And I do, I see some of that, you know, sometimes we get folks, oh, there was a guy who popped up on the internet like a year or two years ago and was making everything out of <laughs> concrete and and uh you know i think most of the folks who had been there before were kind of watching and shaking their heads and um <clears throat> and you know nonetheless there were enough new people that that it got some traction and so you know i just i feel like it's important for us to revisit the, th the ideas that were good and or bad and uh so that hopefully we can develop a consistent narrative 
that is shared in all of the places, you know, where people go to seek information about this stuff um, so that we can progress. I mean, that's really the thing is so that we don't just keep going back over the same old ground. And uh, and I think that we've been pretty successful in doing that. I think through the various venues um, we have, you know, I think started to spread the word that, that there's a pretty... Um, you know, there's clear stepping stones, there's a clear path to the progression of these things, you know, leading back to, um, all the way back to Larry Winiarski, um, and, uh, and Yanto and, and, you know, all the steps along the way. Um, but at any rate, yeah, that's, that's great, Augustus. That's good feedback. Thank you for saying that and recognizing that. And, and as I went back into my photos, you know, I did start to, um, see some of that progression and, and it's really interesting to, to look at it. So that was a big goal of mine last week talking about casting because casting does come up often. And, uh, and so I just wanted to, uh, you know, to definitely reiterate that, um, that we've been there and it isn't, it's not, uh, relegated to the dustbin, you know, it's a, it's a viable technology and of a viable method, but, um, but it does, you know, there's reasons why at least some of us personally have moved, you know, past that. And one of the interesting things actually that I, I did a little bit of poking around in some of the old forums and whatnot, you know, I try and keep up every week and, and, uh, and sometimes I'll go and, and look for stuff just kind of for stove chat and just see what's cooking out there. But, um, one of the interesting things, speaking of falling into old pitfalls is, uh, even on, uh, some of the most, you know, where the people should be the most knowledgeable, people still fall into those traps. And, uh, and I just noticed a new build, um, you know, that wasn't working very well. And, and I could see pretty clearly that it doesn't have any insulation, you know, for the most part in most of the places where it needs it. Uh, and this fella, you know, is complaining that it's not working and, and I'm looking at it going, well, you know, it's, it's, it will work. Uh, but you will first have to struggle through that time of getting everything up to optimal temperature. And if you've got like a heavy fire brick box and very little insulation around it, if any at all, and then steel, you know, you're really going to struggle to ever get that entire structure to be able to sustain the kind of temperatures, even internally, that are required to burn cleanly. Um, and I just, I found that kind of, um, you know, it was a little bit uh, disappointing that, that here we are now and some people still haven't grasped that. Now, to be fair, this is a user that I've noticed um, has been posting for years and has um, been trying really hard to <laughs> to accept insulation, you know, as, as an important part of it. But, um, but at any rate, I just found, thought it was really fascinating. So it is, it's important. I think for us to maintain, you know, the idea of progression and that we're moving forward. So, so with that said, uh, we're here to, um, help you guys build, you know, stoves and get over any questions. So if you have questions, by all means, throw them in chat and, uh, and you know, we've got a great group here to tackle that stuff for you and with you. And hopefully you won't end up with, uh, with stoves that are struggling, um, <laughs> after you've built them, hopefully we can address any issues before you build them. So David Swanson asks about burning hemlock and, uh, you know, David, you're, you're asking the right crew here, um, because we are in hemlock country. I think most of the, uh, that crappy <laughs> lumber that, uh, that you get that, that says hem fur on it, that, that is mostly hemlock. Actually, they probably don't even say hem fur anymore, do they? Cause fur is so valuable. Unless I'm showing my age there. They're probably just all hemlock now. Um, but anyway, we got a lot of hemlock here and my answer really is, um, if you can, you know, the best way to burn it is, is not to, <laughs> if you can, if you can avoid it, that isn't to say it's unburnable. Um, but it is, it's like of all of those evergreen trees, you know, it's kind of spongy. And, uh, um, I, th my experience with it is that it really requires, um, kind of like alder si similar. Um, although I think it's a little bit, it's even less desirable in my opinion, cause it's harder to split, but, um, but 
it's so stringy, you know, it's kind of like, a, it's almost like grass inside or something. And uh, I find that uh, what's the most important is seasoning. So to answer your question, David Swanson, I would say just, uh, I know you're in a pretty good part of the country um, for drying things out. So I think that if you just season that hemlock as, as you know, season it well for at least, you know, two seasons if you can or three, um, it will burn and it'll burn it okay as, as much as I'm maligning it it still will be an adequate firewood um, but uh, but yeah it, it isn't very good firewood so um, that's probably my best <laughs> my best advice for you um, and yeah mixing it with oak yeah great question exactly like if you have hemlock or you have any kind of subpar fuel mixing it with um, you know high quality grade high grade fuel is uh, is a great way to utilize that firewood um you know without just saying well i can't burn it so you'll you'll probably get pretty good burning um characteristics that way and it's construction scrap yeah that makes sense i was kind of wondering how you ended up with hemlock down there i was like oh it must be maybe it's old two by fours so yeah that makes sense that it's construction scrap here we get it in the wild i have you know quite a few hemlocks on my property and when i first moved here i i honestly didn't know better um and i went through quite a bit of it um and it's yeah it's not the greatest wood so emma q i think i got, hope i got your name right uh oh it's melissa <laughs> hi melissa i <laughs> nice to see you <laughs> um let's see so she says i have a question about bypass run length given an insulated cfb channel would 24 inches from center of riserless core top aperture to center of chimney flue without living on the edge for startup yeah melissa i totally understand your question you're, you're asking how far can that bypass be can we extend that out to the chimney absolutely you can um what's important here is that the gases uh you know think of them like a like a hot air balloon right as long as they can sort of continue unobstructed to the chimney you know so that they generally flow clearly to the chimney you really aren't limited much in length and if you notice in the plans the bypass as i designed it was really quite small much smaller than system size than chimney size and that again just kind of indicates that it's not totally crucial that this passageway is um capable of maintaining the entire flow of the stove. What's important is that when you light the stove, the initial little puff of hot gas finds its way to that chimney, hopefully all up. You know, it doesn't, there's no, if, if we can't have any downdraft sections because that'll cool the gases too much. But as long as it's all sort of generally heading uphill, horizontally uphill, and it's insulated, like you said, you can absolutely extend that or make it generally as long as you want and in in for other folks not for your specific situation melissa but um in other build situations sometimes we'll have that bypass just venting into a large open bell and typically the exhaust picks up down at the bottom of the bell but we might have a bypass opening up high in the bell and even if it has to go all the way across that bell as long as it's kind of all uphill uh, that usually works just great. So um, hopefully that answers your question, Melissa, and I hope that you're making good progress on your build. I'm excited to see it. So Melissa, for the rest of you, is someone who uh, she and I had a little consultation a few weeks ago, and she's got a really, really neat design. Um, to be honest with you, Melissa, I was thinking about your drawing, and I'm excited for, the, for you to get it done. So hopefully we can share it with the group, because I think that you, the concept is is a really good one in terms of the layout and um, sort of illustrating what's possible with the you know starting with a one of the cook stoves as a as a base. So yeah, you're welcome. I hope that helped. Um, so let's see. So um, with that said, let's uh, let's move on to well, keep if anyone has more questions, keep them coming because those are great. But let's move on. I got something. Um, I'd love to show you here. So David Swanson says, what might be the best ceramic blanket adhesive? Good rigidizer, but adhesive. 
okay, that's a great question, David. Um, there is or are, I should say, I, I suppose there are multiple, um, but I'm aware of one for sure, and I, I won't remember the brand, but there are specific adhesives for ceramic fiber products. Um, you can find them at refractory suppliers. I think you're in California. I found the, the, the ones that I've purchased, and I still have some cocks of it. Oh, I remember what it's called. It's called Fiber Frax. Um, and uh, and they, are, they are specifically made to adhere those products to other materials. You're asking about Blanket to Steel. I think that that product will work for that. You might want to check um, their you know, uh, documentation, but I believe it'll work. But Fiberfrax was the brand. I found it at Western Industrial Ceramics. Uh, they had locations in Portland and somewhere like Hawthorne or Burbank or something like that in California. Um, I, and I don't remember, I guess I had it shipped. Um, but, uh, at any rate, I, th I do think that's probably your best bet is to use that engineered solution because I'm not sure um, what else you're going to be able to use that's going to be able to handle the temperatures. You know, RTV would be my best guess. Um, I know you've had quite a bit of experience using RTV. So, you know, if you didn't want to buy anything fancy, I'd probably start with RTV and see if it worked. Um, but I think that uh, that if success is really crucial to you then then you might want to go to the you know the the refractory industry and see what solutions they have um, specifically for that so and I assume you're talking about um, securing that blanket to your the inside of your drum and I'll be curious to see what you come up with I know we talked about you know pins tack welded through it or whatever but um, but I'll be curious to see I think spots of adhesive would also be a, a good one. So, um, so hopefully that helps. Uh, and I'd love to hear what you come up with. So nice to see you guys, Permaculture Playground and Robin and, uh, Mark Hale. Thanks for being here. You guys welcome. Welcome. Um, so when David says he tried Rutland products and yeah, you know, Rutland tends to be, I, mean, I think you know this now, and I think we all know this, but Rutland tends to be fairly um, consumer grade for someone kind of dealing with a, a box stove <laughs> usually. And uh, um, it, you know, it doesn't really go much beyond sort of like the lightest use applications. So um, <clears throat> I know that chasing down the refractory stuff can sometimes be a pain in the butt, but in the interest of experimentation I find it's worthwhile you know that was always that, that has always been kind of one of my favorite aspects of this um, this path of rocket stoves of, of being a rocketeer you know as I just love finding those materials and then I'll just order them and and play with them and um, you know I find it really <laughs> really fun that's how we got the RA 330 and you know whatever else ceramic fiber board and not on and on so um I purchased those fiber frax tubes of caulk myself actually to when I first started buying ceramic fiber board to glue them together and I and I never <laughs> I never settled on my final design <laughs> so I still have however many years I think they want to say those tubes of caulk are probably seven or eight years old now I'm sure they're they're toast um, but uh, <laughs> but there you go um, I don't think I ever ever tried it myself so uh, um, I'm having a hard time with your username there, but 31 says homemade water glass seems like it could work very well. And, uh, and then David says rigidizer 32 works, but needs to be saturated. So uses too much. And I think that'd be the thing with water glass too, is that, is that it's not really a great adhesive in, in, in a, you know, just like a thin coating. And in this application we're talking about, I think, you know, you're really going to need something that has some body to it because, uh, well, because otherwise you're just going to be sticking just like two fibers to the to the steel. You know, you really need something that kind of can get into the fiber and form a glob. I mean, it seems like a caulk or a silicone or something like that consistency is kind of what you are going to want. 
I don't know exactly, but um, but yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd give those things a try. I'd start with our TV. I mean, if you haven't tried it yet, I think that'd probably be your your best bet. And uh, um, I'm thinking about, you know, when I talked about how we did it in boats, how there'd be a pin that would be welded to the hole, and then you'd stick the soft insulation onto the pin, and then you'd put a little cap. It was a lot like doing upholstery, really, um, in, in a lot of ways that, you know, you'd um, stick that cap on there and that would contain it. And I'm almost wondering, David, if when you're gluing that blanket, if, if you almost don't need, uh, you know, I, something to make the blanket solid right there. I think you'll just have to play with it, I guess. Um, so Mart Hale says, I've been looking at other refractories on YouTube. There's one called Satanite and you don't know much about it. I haven't heard of that one. I don't think it sounds like it is likely a brand name like someone's uh you know just decided to call their version of something that um you know y usually you you'd hear that it'd be like ceramic fiber or ceramic wool or um whatever else there is uh, fiberglass whatever so um and then uh so i'm not sure i'd like to i'll have to look into that that's actually interesting to hear about another thing though i will definitely look into that and then David says, Rutland cement thinned with water. Yeah, that might be an idea, uh, something worth trying, David. I think, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I feel almost feel like, like I said, I think you're going to want to get something that sort of like makes kind of a hard point in your in your ceramic fiber right at your mount point and then glue that to it, almost like high temp epoxy or something. I don't know. Um, yeah, I'll have to, we'll have to look at that video of Satan night, um, and see what that's all about. Cause obviously we're always looking for new and interesting insulating, you know, ways to insulate. Um, uh, you just reminded me, you know, that a few years ago, people got excited about starlight <clears throat> and I think a lot of us played with that thinking maybe there was some potential there. seems like there's not, you know, when starlight which I'll forget now what it is. What is it? Corn syrup and or cornstarch and uh, and baking soda and I don't remember, but uh, but definitely played with it and it you know does work. You, know, you can keep the torch off your hand for a little while, but as it burns off, you're really just making like a carbon lattice. That's why it's so insulative, but it has you know zero mechanical properties. Um, and David says hard points are just too easy. Yeah, you're right. Okay, well, keep trying. Let us know what you come up with. I mean, I do think that you could, uh, you know, possibly stitch it, maybe, David. Um, I'm not sure how exactly you do that. I think glue is probably the best way. Um, but uh, who knows? Yeah, Mar Martin Hale says he tested Starlight and it broke broke down. And, and that was my experience, too. So I'd be curious to hear what this Satanite is. I do sort of think that... Um, at the moment, ceramic fiber is, uh, you know, the, the best thing we found. I mean, I was, I've been really getting into space, uh, our space progress lately, watching uh, SpaceX and those guys launch their stuff and um, all the spaceships all over. It's really cool. And I was watching, uh, there. I watched something on um SpaceX's bakery where they make the outer tiles of the rockets, you know, all of the, the parts of the rockets and Starship and Dragon and whatever. And, you know, they're baking ceramic fiber pieces, basically. I mean, I, they didn't go into the, I didn't see anything about the process, but without seeing any of it and knowing what they're using, which is basically ceramic fiber, you know, I can basically guess that they're tearing up the ceramic fiber, you know, and then reforming it into their shapes they want and then using whatever the binder is that, that we use, um, rice starch or whatever. They probably don't use that binder actually, or they do maybe, and then they bake it all off. Maybe that's what it is and that's why it's called the bakery. They must just cure them, pre-cure those tiles. Um, so, uh, so, um, yeah, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'd be surprised if this Satanite was something in a different family entirely because it does seem like ceramic fiber, you know, not, we haven't really exceeded ceramic fiber in terms of refractory insulations um, that I found. And I, I mentioned, and I think it was the first stove chat this year, maybe it was a while ago, but I mentioned, you know, being so 
surprised when I watched, um, what was it? It was the Urban Cowboy from like 1977 with John Travolta. And he was a, he was a, a, a roughneck he, on, or whatever, working in the oil fields, or he, he might have been working at the refinery, but he was insulating. And they were using ceramic fiber insulating sleeves, riser sleeves, which was kind of our first introduction to ceramic fiber in the rocket stove world. Um, and I just thought that was really interesting. And I guess what I'm trying to say is going back to the 70s, that was modern technology. And now it's still what we put on the outside of our spaceships. Um, so I, I, I'd be pretty surprised if there was, uh, you know, another refractory insulative alternative out there that we were missing out, that we were missing the boat on. Um, but I'll be interested to see it. I, I keep thinking that there must be a way to do that with like perlite to somehow form that. But I think that, th that they do that. And that's basically insulated fire bricks. You know, it's like, well, as soon as you put that other material with it, you end up with sort of a, um, a brick, you know, that's just kind of what it is. So, um, at any rate, <laughs> I'm just kind of rambling, but, uh, but um, Mart Hale says, I was wondering if, or wanting ceramic fiber thread and wondering if there was such a thing, it would be good to sew it together. And uh, Tall Shadow says, sorry, I'm late, dog ate my homework. No, uh, no recess for you today, Tall Shadow. You'll have to stay and do your homework. Um, <laughs> which in this case is, uh, is finding out what to use to sew together. So Mart Hale, I think actually, in my opinion, I'd be, um, I'd feel pretty comfortable using like fiberglass roving as thread for ceramic fiber um, constructions. You know, the, the fiberglass, while it isn't quite as uh, thermally resilient, like it won't hold the temperatures quite the ceramic fiber board will, it'll hold, you know, ha handle a lot. Like I was talking about last week, that's what, you know, people use for welding blankets and stuff like that. So uh, fiberglass, which is just silica fibers, I believe, um, and they make roving so they, you know, you can find string of it basically. Um, and I think that would hold up in almost any type of construction. So you could probably use fiberglass roving to stitch panels of ceramic fiberboard together and create something there. The ceramic fiberboard isn't terribly durable to that kind of tearing. Um, you know, once you poke a hole in it, that area kind of starts to get a little soft. Um, so it might not be, but wool, you could probably stitch wool together. Um, <laughs> interesting. So Tall Shadow says, so we owe John Travolta for introducing us to, uh, to ceramic fiber. I think so. I mean, <laughs> at least, you know, uh, at least in the, uh, in Hollywood, I think that was the first, um, public example of ceramic fiber, at least that I saw. <laughs> so, um, so anyways, uh, glad you guys are all here, by the way. Thanks for showing up, Tall Shadow and Permaculture Playground and all the rest. Really, really appreciate you guys being here. Um, so David says he found a discarded dishwasher with a stainless steel front. So we'll try that as the wood burning base liner and secondary air channel. Awesome. I love that, David. I love to hear that. So that's you know, I've talked about that in the past, but that's exactly, excuse me, how I picture these things coming together is, uh, is with sort of found pieces like that. And I do, I think you could use that, uh, that stainless liner, um, that stainless steel, you know, to create, like you said, that liner base for your firebox that creates the secondary air channel underneath it. Um, you know, maybe some door parts or whatever. So that's, that's awesome. Um, so David says ceramic fiber blanket is reasonably cheap on eBay. It is ceramic fiber blanket is a great alternative to build with. I recently changed, um, well, I released the eight inch J stove plans and they utilize a five minute riser type construction. So ceramic fiber um, blanket as opposed to board for the riser, which does save some money and makes for a, you know, real easy to build riser. Um, and, uh, Mart Hale says, <clears throat> thinking of using the, uh, stainless steel trash cans as a form, um, and then some ceramic fiber blanket. And 
Yeah, so depending on what you're trying to achieve, Mart, um, <laughs> now I just, I just uh, realized that you could be Martha. It could be Martha LE7, <laughs> but I'm just going to keep calling you Mart Hale. I'm not sure how to say your username. <laughs> I apologize. I think we've been over this before. Um, but at any rate, uh, depending on what kind of configuration you're trying to build, often you can just take that ceramic fiber blanket and you can stick it inside a round form without needing to stitch it together or do anything else. It'll hold the shape inside of there just by the um, tension of the ceramic fiber board wanting to unfold. But it depends on what you're trying to do. And, and, uh, and like we've talked about before, you can certainly... Um, use things like stitching and stuff like that to build some more complex shapes. So, um, so yeah, I think like tall shadow says, uh, traditional scrounging, like, like the original heaters, you know, is really what we're used to. So we'll be curious to see what you come up with, David. It's going to be interesting to see how that works out. And, you know, I've been pretty, at, um, vocal proponent uh, for anyone building my stoves as well, you know, people will call, will often write me before they purchase plans and say, how much does, will it cost to build one of these stoves? And, you know, my answer is typically, uh, it could be as, as low as almost free, you know, probably just purchasing ceramic fiber board, if that's the direction you're going. So maybe just a couple hundred bucks and almost everything else could be salvaged, um, to as much as you want to spend, you know, if you would like to purchase doors and hardware, um, but I do think that almost everything can be salvaged. And, uh, David is saying he'd love to find stainless steel trash cans. <clears throat> it is hard to find stainless because everyone else is looking for it too. But I do think that if you are sort of persistent in your scrapping, you'll find quite a bit. And one of the best sources, especially for sheet is those old, is like David has found stainless um, appliances. Now, often they're just sort of stainless <laughs> colored. <laughs> they don't, aren't actually made out of stainless steel, but usually there will be some pieces of stainless incorporated into those. Um, and they can be found, you know, for re relatively reasonable. And then as, as Smart Hale says, just search on Craigslist for stainless, which is <clears throat> another reasonable, um, way to find it for sure just like all just like all of our salvage stuff and i'll say it said it before i'll say it again if you are thinking about building a stove and you're thinking where am i going to find insulated fire brick kiln brick um red brick clay brick old glass stove tops any of those you know chimney flue pipe any of the things that we are you know old old wood stoves themselves are a great resource any of those types of things you're looking for it's always worth your time to run your own ad and say, you know, go on Craigslist and just say, hey, looking for your old chimney pipe. Um, I'll come pick it up out of your junk pile, your broken kitchen range, your broken stainless appliance. You know, you just sit, your, your old broken pottery kiln, your, you know, pile of red bricks behind the barn. Often people will um, let you come get it for free uh, and if not, you know, sometimes you can make a deal for something that you otherwise weren't going to get for any reasonable price. And sometimes you can get really cool stuff like, you know, really cool bricks or whatever for reasonable prices. So David says he's looking for a stainless refrigerator, which is, you know, would be great. And then Permaculture Playground throws out the best advice, I think, for finding, you know, solid, good stainless, which is um, kegs, you know, old kegs of various sizes and permaculture, permaculture, permaculture playground says five gallon kegs, and there's other sizes as well. And that's actually what I had in my mind, but I couldn't think of it, but I have a keg in my scrap pile, um, for that reason, you know, it's just a great source of stainless and the keg stainless is actually pretty stout and it's fairly high quality. It's actually stainless. You know, you can try and stick a magnet to it and it, and it won't respond, um, as opposed to some of the cheaper appliances, um, which are stainless, you know, pretty low grade stainless, and they usually will kind of show some magnetic um, attraction, which means they're not, you know, not very high end stainless, not much nickel, I think is what that is. I'm not exactly sure. Um, so yeah, David says it's hard to find the kegs anymore because they have deposits. Yeah, that's probably true. Um, 
You just need uh, derelict friends who leave them at your house and forget about their deposit. <laughs> I think that's how I got mine um, ages ago. So uh, let's see. Um, yeah, so David Swanson says, have kegerator. So the Firestone Walker DVA keg and kegerator. <laughs> Delicious. Yeah, we're going to we're gonna end up with a whole outdoor kitchen here before too long. Um, so on that note, actually, outdoor kitchen, let's, I'd like to show you guys, um, something I found a little, a diagram actually, which is really cool. And it's something that I kind of have been wanting to revisit for a little while here. So this is a diagram. Let's see if this works. There, there it is. So this is a diagram of my basic, um, rocket stove cooker layout and i've been pretty encouraged lately because i've seen others now starting to adapt this and this is a, just a really simple concept that i came up with probably about 10 years ago i think this drawing is about 10 years old now and this is it in its simplest form and this is nothing new you guys have all seen this there was a ton of i did a ton of videos on this type of build they weren't always using the same base you know, sometimes they were batch boxes or uh, like the one we looked at last week or whatever that was going to go in the same configuration. But what's important here is not the core, but basically we have a J-tube core. What's important is that the exhaust comes out just under the um, barrel, which is, it doesn't have to be the barrel. Let's call this the cooktop lid. And the cooktop lid has a smaller hole, four inch diameter hole, that's just slightly smaller than system size. So here it's a six inch exhaust. So this is a six inch chimney and a four inch hole. I didn't do a very good job drawing it. My, <laughs> my scale is all off. Um, but picture this hole up top is four inches and this is six inches. And the reason that's important is because even when that's open all the way, this stove is still relying on the gas is cooling in the barrel and falling down and exiting out through the chimney. And in doing that, um, what you eventually get is a stove that's drawing hard enough. You know, once you get draft established, it can draw hard enough that as you progressively, you use a flap to open or close to change the size of this hole. And, you know, at some point it can be like half open or even more and no flames or smoke, you know, or exhaust are coming out there. It's being pulled down to the chimney. And the reason this works so well is you can put your cooking implement right over the top. And if it's in the case of like a pot, like if you're just boiling water, the pot could actually set down in there there's still enough flow to go out through the chimney for the stove to rock it, right? So the stove is gonna run at full tilt, um, which is important, right? We don't kill the draft by adjusting the cooking rate. Um, and in doing that, we create maximum heat up top. So the what's cool and unique about this what I was looking for was basically a way to create an adjustable flamed cooking heat source using solid wood fuel that doesn't smoke or put exhaust into the house. Now, we've all seen like Lorena stoves and other third world type cooker, you know, cookers designed for people in, in the third world, you know, to try and clean up their air quality in both inside and outside and reduce their fuel use and all of those things. And this was my approach to allow people to cook with the type of control that they're used to with a propane or an electric stove. Um, as uh, Mart Hale says, great heat transfer with that design. Because, and it, it is, you can put that um, pot all the way down in there. And then Mart Hale says, I would imagine that this would need to be outside. And so that's kind of, I think that, 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 um, how can I say this? Uh, yes, Mart Hale, in, 
in our culture, this would be an outdoor heater um, or an outdoor cooker. But keep in mind that this concept of cooking over fire in a lot of countries, we're looking for something that's simply better than them cooking over an open fire in an enclosed hut. And so this simple cooker actually, I believe, could be used indoors, not in a modern Western airtight home. Um, but I think it could safely be used indoors in most applications because like I said, that hole on top is smaller. And if you start the stove with the flap closed, so if that top hole is closed and you establish good draft, then you really only need a tiny bit when that thing's raging, a tiny bit open to heat a pot or in the case of liquid cooking, the pot would fit down in there and it would seal that hole, which we'd have a little higher over the riser, um, but it would seal the hole. But anyway, any rate, what I'm trying to say is I actually believe that, um, that this actually would be a really good alternative for indoor cooking in a lot of places where they don't have, you know, adequate indoor cooking and in, in some of the places where we're trying to make improvements. Um, yeah. So, uh, when I originally designed this, that was kind of my goal because that was really the big push in rocket stoves at the time, you know, was these humanitarian type stoves. And I kept seeing these stoves, uh, that still didn't offer a lot of control. They didn't offer, you know, significant control over the cooking. And I thought that this was a better way to achieve that without really getting into real complex um, builds like gasifiers. Even those don't offer much control, but they do offer, you know, some, some, basically what I'm trying to do is create a burner, you know, like a blue flamed burner with rate, you know, the ability to rate, you know, control the rate at which it hits your pot um, using solid wood fuel. And this does it very effectively, very, very simply. And so I thought that was, I still think it's very unique. And the reason I wanted to revisit it is because I still think to today that this is probably the best design, not necessarily with the barrel, but just this concept is still probably the best way for people who are building themselves rocket powered pizza ovens, rocket powered, um, outdoor cooking situations of any kind. Uh, you know, whether you're going to put a griddle over the top of that or whatever, the concept of having the rocket stove core, I need to boil this down so you guys know what I'm talking about. Cause I think you can, you guys know, but, but why is it different than the other things that we see? Cause the other rocket stove cook solutions that we see typically don't offer an alternative path for the flue gases to go out a separate exhaust and thus don't offer you much control over, you know, what's coming out of the riser. Cause usually what it is is you're just cooking right over the riser and you're adjusting temperature by adjusting what's happening in the firebox. <clears throat> and this is different and I'm not the first one to do this. I'm not trying to take credit for it. This is again, uh, Larry Winiarski and his industrial cook stoves where they would have the big pot suspended kind of down in that hole, um, in a, in a structure just like this. It's really, you know, based on that concept. So it's not my invention, but this iteration of it is, and the simple idea of reducing that what he had as a pot skirt, you know, it was a place to put the pot, but reducing that down to be a burner hole with a flap that goes over it. Um, I've haven't, hadn't seen that anyone else do that. And it works phenomenally. So for, you know, if you were to go out into the bush and build yourself a little off grid cabin and you needed, you know, a, a camp kitchen and you just needed to throw one up and you were going to use it all summer. Like this would be the ultimate way to go. In my opinion, you um, throw your 60 bricks in a barrel with your flue pipe and put it on a sled and, you know, run it out there or roll it out there or whatever. And, uh, you have a really great setup for really versatile cooking. Um, 
So catch back up with chat here. Um, Permaculture Playground says the smoke from their open fire helps keep their huts termite free. I once heard a story of some aid organization handing out nice clean stoves and years later came back to find nobody was using them. Isn't that interesting? And I do know that that's a common thing is that is that it the adoption of the stoves is difficult because it has to fit, you know, their cultural paradigm. You know, it's very difficult to change <clears throat> someone's acculturation. Um, so, uh, you know, that's something that's a real um, strong theme in my life overall. <laughs> and uh, those, some of you guys know what I'm talking about. And, uh, and I think in rocket stoves overall is, is um, even in this country where we're, you know, butting up against a, a culture of, of metal box stoves, you know, people have a hard time understanding that we can do so much better. And even when given the alternative, they just don't get it because it's outside of, you know, what their mom did or their dad did or how they grew up. So pretty normal. And in those third world countries, that's been one of the biggest challenges of bringing them cleaner technologies is that if they can't cook the way they're used to cooking, you know, squatting down inside the hut or sitting with the family in such a way or whatever it is, they won't do it. And so sometimes those little stoves just don't fit, you know, the, the paradigm correctly. Um, so, so, and, and permaculture playground goes on to say the way I regulate the temperature of my indoor gasifier is by either not using a cook plate or using a small cast iron disc as a cook plate. Yeah, that's cool. That's a, that's a great way to do it. Um, is is adjusting how much mass you have under you know between the fire and your cooking item and uh using a diffuser or a deflector adding mass removing mass um really good way to go and and as i take this a little further i want it we'll, we'll go right into that so great great topic here um so mart hale says the cast iron pan is a great heat diffuser Absolutely, I found that so many times using this same um, this same layout inside a little pizza oven, but using a cast iron. In my case, I used, I think, a griddle that I had, and I could push it off to one side using a little stick, and I'll use that as the diffuser um, and adjust how the pizza cooked. So permaculture playground says and for my three burner outdoor gas fire unit i have a one foot diameter sewer lid oh that's awesome that's like uh short bus life i think has a sewer lid as well and that's one of the best i think cast iron salvage sources is those old uh, sewer lids they are just fantastic for that use um so Tall Shadow says, so mainly used as a cooker, the barrel in your drawing is really not needed and could be mass like brick or even wrapped with insulation to keep the cook from getting cooked as well. Exactly, Tall Shadow. Very astute. Thank you for picking up on that. This is uh, really a very old, you know, this is a vintage drawing of, of rocket stoves in their infancy. This prehistoric rocket stove T-Rex roaming the, the uh, Pleistine rocket stove world here. And uh, that... <laughs> barrel has now evolved <laughs> into bricks or whatever you want for the surround. And so, um, you know, this uh, conversation is actually really cool because this does dovetail into where we went from there, you know, and this, my barbecue brick oven is really sort of a, a version of this um, using my riserless core. So while we're here, let me, um, I wonder if it'll just grab the next thing. Will it show this to you? No. Okay. Hold on guys. I got to get you this. Um, I gotta, let's see. That's it. Okay. So I'm going to show you this thing. So after I, after I did that, I was like, okay, I'm going to build one of these with a J-tube in the ground, and I'm going to put a pizza oven on top of the barrel, but basically with that same layout that we saw. So I had this old core, and this was one, an early refractory cast um, experiment that I did, and, uh, and it cracked because I put that ceramic fiber. You'll see it again. It'll come back. Put that ceramic fiber in between the the burn tunnel and the, and the feed tube or the, well, in between the feed tube and the riser stub. And, 
And so it cracked and blew apart. And I was like, okay, I'm going to bury it. So here I am. I make mud with perlite. And then I bury this core that's all blown to pieces. And I'm like, well, if it's all blown to pieces, it isn't going to matter, you know, if it's all buried in clay perlite all around it. Because I basically got, you know, like a mold of clay perlite. Now, this is really early on. So I'm all, all excited because I've got a super insulated um, burn tube there. And then I just pack it with clay perlite all around. And now you can see that, uh, that who cares if the core is cracked, right? Like <laughs> it's not going anywhere. So then a uh, ceramic fiber, uh, John Travolta, riser your sleeve right there. And then the barrel goes over the top. You can see I got the hole down low for exhaust. And there we go. There's basically that cooker that we were just looking at uh, completed. And you know, this didn't take very long. I think it took me a few hours to build it. Of course, I had the core cast, but you could easily do that with a uh, with a brick core. You could stack one down in there. And then, so let's see. I don't know if we get shots of the whole thing here. This is just an old uh, little thing I found that I had created. Um, but then once I was done with that, I think that's the end of that. So once I was done with that, I built this little oven and, uh, let's see, let me get it up here for you. So it looks kind of like the Death Star <laughs> and, uh, I just built it like obviously so crappy. Um, I just had these scraps of wood. I just used a uh, hot glue, I think to, um, to fasten this little oven t mold together. Uh, and it's just, you know, you know me, I was, <laughs> I just was like more in a hurry to test out my theory than to build something nice, but it's sitting on top of that barrel right here. It's sitting on top of the cooker. And as you, as we move through it, I said, okay, well that's, there's my oven shape. That's good enough. <laughs> and I covered it with paper. So I was able to then once I covered the paper, it was able to support refractory. So I used castable refractory and I just mudded it onto the outside with my bare hands. You can see my fingerprints all over it. And that was good enough to create for me this solid little three quarter inch igloo. <laughs> yeah, Star Traveler, exactly. A little three quarter inch thick refractory igloo. And the idea was that I pre-created the inner shell of what then could be a big oven build. Now I never really finished this and eventually I tore it all apart. I think the oven stayed together. I was able to pick it up off of there and put it back on as a shell and I was able to use it like this, but this wasn't really a finalized concept, but the concept was I would build the shell like that and then incorporate it into as tall shadow ref uh, referred to, you know, if we were to build this cooker, not as a barrel cooker, but as a brick structure, as a more permanent structure with the oven on top, one could put this little oven shell in a brick enclosure with just the door of the igloo protruding. And then you could pack the inside of that with insulation and insulative perlite and clay or ceramic wool or whatever and build up all around it and make it super insulated. And you could build yourself a crazy awesome oven using those principles of having this inner shell and then building up around it. Now you might build up right around the outside with some high mass materials so that it would hold heat and then insulate that. It really would depend on what your goals were. But at any rate, it, that was a really fun project um, that I did quite a while ago, and uh, and it worked really well. And and mostly what I really wanted to share about that was inside that oven was that cooking um, setup. So I would have I actually had like a I, I made look what basically looked like a spatula, right? Like a big flap on the end of a long handle, so I could open or close the opening on top of the barrel inside the oven and it was underneath a pizza stone so there was a pizza stone in the oven raised up over the barrel so it was a diffuser for the um, cooking heat and it worked really well and it was very very um, you know easy to build and didn't require a lot of materials so it didn't look great but like I said if someone wanted to 
uh, go the extra mile, you could, you know, build a really nice brick outdoor kitchen structure with something like that on top. And you'd have yourself a ton of, uh, of function without really investing a lot into it. So in Mart Hale says you can use standard fiberglass insulation inside a 55 gallon barrel. Yeah, I think so. I think that would, that would work great, um, to insulate that. And, uh, and an upside down flower pot with a handle to fit on top is another great way to do it. I mean, that's actually a uh, permaculture playground. That's beautiful. I mean, thank you for saying that because really that's all you need, right? To make a ceramic enclosed oven on top of a barrel like that, you just get a big ceramic flower pot and a handle and, and you know, you basically close the dome over it. And I think that's a really cool idea um, and and for sure could work. So and we've seen, you know, similar things, but there's a lot of simple ways to accomplish that. Uh, so with that said, um, there's that. So, yeah, Tall Shadow says thanks for sharing that early iteration. You're welcome, Tall Shadow. One of the reasons I wanted to share that was really just to um, mostly revisit that idea of routing the gases that way for cooking. Um, it's something that I just saw someone's post on some forum somewhere. They had done something similar. Oh, I think it was, maybe it was Martin's, I think it was Martin's glass J tube on, on donkey's forum. Um, which is really a cool, he did, he did like a J cooker and he used that same method with the hole on top and put a piece of glass over there, which you, which you can do, um, as well to use as a cooking surface. And, uh, yeah, just a really, really neat way to go. And I do think that, um, you know, it's been quite a few years since I did that and was kind of promoting that build on YouTube of mine. And I was using my outdoor cooker all the time in those days. And, uh, and I wanted to revisit it because I still think that it has a lot of value and, um, yeah, if anyone's building, you know, doing anything like that, building themselves any sort of outdoor cooker, that is a fantastic way to go. I actually, you know, I think that if you are sort of a, a <laughs> sort of like a kind of a wild thing, but I do, I think it'd be the kind of thing you could take somewhere with you, you know, that's kind of why I had my aluminum series was then I could just stack them up and have an outdoor cooker like that. Um, but I do, I think that's the kind of thing you could like take on your camping trip and stack up your bricks, you know, and put your thing there and cook on it all weekend and sit around, you know, I think it'd be, it'd be awesome. So, so there you go. So David Swanson says 55 gallon barrel on top of Matt's riserless design works very well for 500 degrees at the top of the barrel. That's awesome to hear, David. Thank you for, uh, for sharing that. That's fantastic. And, uh, and Mart Hale says he loves his rocket oven as well. So, uh, yeah, you know, I, I love my rocket cooking stuff so much and I that is really why I wanted to go back there is just, you know, make sure that we don't say, Oh, we're not talking about it anymore, it must be a bad idea, you know, absolutely not. Those ideas work um you know, they're they they still work awesome. So, uh Mart Hale says, uh forty five minutes from lighting my oven to eating pizza. Fantastic. Yep, it's you know, that's such a cool thing. They take so little time to come up to heat and temp. Um, and then Tall Shadow says once the core is established, there's so many options, uh, only limited by your imagination. So yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's really, really fun stuff for sure. And, uh, yeah, it's really awesome to, uh, to share those things with you. So Wanderan, hello. Thanks for being here. Just in time for the sign off. <laughs> so that has, it's been, uh, it's been an hour for today. So um, I think I'm going to sign off. I do have a whole nother series of photos that we didn't get into today. So maybe we'll do that next week. Um, but yeah, I'm going to sign off for today. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. I hope you have a great rest of your week. Um, 
by all means, please send in your photos, send me pictures of your build, um, send me your questions. If you haven't checked out my website, walkerstoves.com, there's a link in the description. Go check that out. Uh, there's plans there available to purchase for building cook stoves and heaters like we're talking about. And I would love to help you build your stove. So um, please check it out. And thank you guys all so much, as always, for your support and for being here. I really appreciate it. It's been awesome. It's always such a good time. And uh, I will see you guys next week. So, all right, everybody. Have an awesome week. I don't know where my, <laughs> my mouse is. And... Uh, I'll see you guys next Wednesday. All right. Thanks, guys.